everyone, Jennifer here. I have a very exciting guest for you today, Shay Elliott from the Elliott Homestead. Welcome back to The Daily Connoisseur. I'm so excited that we have Shay here today. She is an author, she is a YouTuber, she's a homesteader, and we are so thrilled to have you on the channel. Welcome, Shay. Thank you. It's so fun to get to chat with you. I know. This is so cool because I love Shay's YouTube channel. So if you don't uh, subscribe to her channel, you have got to check it out. I will leave a link down below. But I love the style of your videos because you and your husband just have this unique, I've never seen it before on YouTube, where you both kind of narrate the video right. and um, you live in such a beautiful place and there's just so much that we need to talk about. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> but yeah. What's interesting you say that because the narration began because we have four little children and every time we would try to record audio as we were filming, it would just be destroyed by you know, screaming or interruptions. <laughs> and so we started doing this style where we would put the video together and then after they'd go to bed at night, we'd sit down together and talk through the video. And so it kind of was born out of necessity. <laughs> well, that is just so smart and it's so interesting yeah. to do that. I totally relate. We both have four children. She and I have a lot in common. We both have four yeah. children. We both homeschool. Mm -hmm. We're both writers. And so I can't wait to hear how you get it all done because people ask me that question all the time too. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I so. think we're just gluttons for punishment. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Right. Why not? <laughs> we have this one life. Why not? Right. So um, I have her book here that I ordered called Seasons at the Farm. And she is the author of a few books. This is not the only one. So I'll leave her books down below. But this is such a beautiful book, and I was even up late last night reading it, and um, I just love it. It's just so lush and full of just recipes and advice and just a glimpse inside your everyday life. So um, tell yeah, us a little bit about the book. It's exactly what we wanted to capture was just everyday life, and I'm sure you've run into this as well. Oftentimes when, for example, we have guests over and I give them cloth napkins, they're like, no, 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 it's fine. Just give me a regular one. I'm like, no, this is, this is actually what we use. Yeah, we don't have regular ones. <laughs> so whether it's just our family eating on a Tuesday for lunch or whether we have guests on a Friday night, we really try to bring this just joy and kind of what we call like the everyday celebration to our home. And so yes. the environment that we're building in our home is a beautiful aroma to people as they come in or for the people living here. So that's what we really tried to capture in the book was what does that look like every day? And, and you captured it beautifully. Um, I get the same thing. I did a breakfast video on like what I eat for breakfast and I didn't think, I thought people were going to comment on the food, but everyone was talking about the dishes and they're like, I can't believe you yeah. eat off these dishes. And I'm like, oh, well, and somebody What's said, you, did you do this just for the YouTube video? And I was like, no, yeah. <laughs> you should see my dishes. They're full of cracks and chips and because that's yeah. what we use every day. Right. Yeah. yeah so. Very much the same. So we just did a home tour video and the reaction was, oh, you obviously staged it for, for the video. And I thought, no, this is actually what it looks like all the time. <laughs> Right. Why would, it's like, I don't understand. I mean, I guess I can see why people maybe would do that, but I don't understand the point of that. Like, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I just don't think, um, our culture doesn't really encourage that just cultivation. Our house has become a pit stop between one event and the other. And this idea of cultivating your home to be the place is kind of foreign in a way. Yes. It seems like we have these massive kitchens and granite countertops and we don't cook. Yes. Oh. I'm always talking about that. How, you know, if you watch HGTV, everyone's like, oh, you know, or if you watch a show where people are buying a house, oh, we can get this because this has a great entertaining space. But yet right. they never, who entertains? Yeah. When yeah. are you invited to somebody's home? Yeah. You know? my, I, mean, I learned how to entertain. My mom was a great entertainer, but we had a very small house. And it was just like kind of come one, come all. And you're moving people around and people are sitting on the arms of sofas. And I loved that I learned in that capacity because it wasn't create the environment and then invite the people. Mm. It was just invite the people, you know, yes. have the people at your table, no matter what that looks like. Yeah. And I think that was a great lesson. Mm -hmm. And your home seems very inviting. I just love how, you know, in your videos and your tours, you talked about how you like to have books everywhere and just there's music and 
you know, the TV's not always blaring, that mm-hmm. type of thing, you know? And we're much the same way. No, we actually... You don't have yeah, a TV. somebody gave us... We do have a TV, yeah. but we... So we shot a Food Network pilot a few years ago. Right. And they but, bought this huge television to, to watch it on when they were filming it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when they left, they're like, we can throw it in the trash or you can just take it. And I was oh. like, well, we'll take it. But yeah. we used it for homeschool videos. Yeah. <laughs> not connected to anything, so... Um, but no, so our... Uh, there's kind of this Charlotte Mason idea of fill your home with things that inspire creativity yes. and yes. television doesn't inspire creativity. Right. So that's like right. shoved away in the basement. Um, but in our living room, it's the piano and the guitar and the books and the plants and, you know, puzzles and, and mm-hmm. things that sort of encourage you to, to live in the space. Yes. I, mm-hmm. I love that Charlotte Mason philosophy that the atmosphere sets the affection. And so, you know, and it's, they talk, she talks about that with regard to children, you know, it's like, what, what music do they listen to? What books do they read? What, what, um, art do they look at? And, Mm -hmm. uh, I have just been so inspired by that as well, but it's also true for adults. What do, what do we read? What do, what music do we listen to? And what do Mm -hmm. we look at? I was at my sister's house for the 4th of July and, um, the house next to hers was having a big party. And there was a DJ and we were there for like seven hours. Okay. We were there a really long time. And the whole time the DJ was playing music and I, I'm, you know, people, I get a hard time because people are like, Jennifer, you're such a prude, you know, you're so old fashioned, but I'm just sitting there listening to this awful music for seven hours and I'm trying to be cool. I'm like, yes, okay. I can be cool because a lot of it was stuff I listened to when I was in college and in college, I loved it. Like, you know, like I've matured a bit and I've grown up and I'm thinking, um, you know, if you listen to the lyrics to some Mm -hmm. of these songs, I'm terrible. It's terrible. And we've become so desensitized to it. Yeah, we have, but you don't realize how much something like that can set the mood in your home. Yes. And how it affects the culture of your home in such a subconscious way, mm-hmm. you know, especially for our children. So I was having a talk recently with some other homeschool moms and they were kind of, they were kind of, um, sorry. It's okay. It filtered in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and here comes the dad trailing behind. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking to these homeschool moms and they had read something of Charlotte Mason's about playing classical music for your children and about like sitting down and you're having your tea time and you're reading poetry. And they were like, no, we need the worksheets. You know, we need the math sheets. We need the workbooks. Like this is work. And I realized at that point that I was in the wrong homeschool circle because I said, that's, that's the exact point for me, you know, that you're sitting down and you're, and you're creating this energy in your home just through something like classical music Mm -hmm. um, or, or lighting even, you know, or, or tea time or whatever it may be or coffee time. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. You don't realize until you go out of your bubble, like, oh, this is what <laughs> this is what's happening out there. Yes, it's- and I felt so sheltered from it, and I felt mm-hmm. I'm being really dramatic. But and my sister was making fun of me. She was she was trying to dance and like make me, and I and I'm trying to not, you know. But yeah. I was deeply disturbed by it because I thought, <laughs> wow, this is what people are, and the lyrics were so graphic and vulgar, and yeah. I was just like, I can't believe children are listening to this, you know. So anyway. <laughs> Well, tell me this. I mean, I've read, I've read all your books, but I still struggle with the idea that if you say, here's the type of music we're going to listen to in our home, we're not going to listen to this type or whatever. Um, the world has a hard time hearing that even like friends or family. And they just think, why are you so pretentious? Yes. You know, it's, it's, you're such a snob. Yes. <laughs> and I don't know if there's really a way around that. Um, I think my family have lovingly embraced me. <laughs> and they accept me as I am. <laughs> and it's just kind of like a joke to all of us, you know, but it, they all knew when, when the music, they like, my sister started looking at me and I'm like, I'm fine. You know, and that's what's so funny is that when I see my friends or I talk about this all the time, I don't tell people what I do. So uh, like in the, in the, we uh, homeschool through a private satellite program. Mm-hmm. And so all the moms there I'm good friends with, and they're just these awesome women. I love them. And, but I don't tell them what I do because why, I mean, it doesn't come up, you know, why, oh, yeah. by the way, I'm, you know, yeah. so-and-so. I don't ever say that. So, but inadvertently, some of them find out, you know, and mm-hmm. then after that, when I see them, they're like, I, I'm in my yoga pants. I'm sorry. I'm just going to the gym. <laughs> 
<laughs> apologizing to me for the way that they're dressed. I'm like, no, I am not the fashion yeah. police. I'm not, I'm not the music police, but you know, I don't want my kids listening to graphic. Yeah. yeah. I will tell you this though, after reading your books, like it gave me this, uh, these yoga pant goggles that I cannot take off. You can't take and them it, off. I can't take them off. Oh, Jennifer, it drives me insane. I'm so aware, particularly of men's fashion. Mm. It it strikes me probably even more than the women's because yeah. Yeah. a dressed up man is such a fine, oh. you know, it's, it's just yeah. so lovely. And, you know, you're at the airport and you see, I saw this this dad one time with super pant, Superman pajama pants on, you know, and <laughs> flip flops. And I just thought, you're a grown man. This is so yes. odd. This is what she's talking about. <laughs> yes, there's a lack of maturity in our culture, I think. Right. And I think that's kind of what it, it's just disrespectful it's in just, a way. <laughs> yeah, it's disrespectful. It's not mature. It's like for some reason, our generation has grown up, but we haven't, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look back into the past and... I used to think when I was a little kid, I remember finding out that a woman was 30, right? And and I would be like, oh, she's 30. She's like older. She has it together. But now it's like you know, the 30 year olds are, you know, ripped jeans, messy bun. Like, I, yeah. and I'm not, okay. And I know I'm going to get hate comments. Just spare the hate comments. Just hear me out. Okay. People hear me out. Is that sometimes when you go to an event for your children and you see everybody in yoga pants and ripped jeans and just nobody cares anymore. Mm -hmm. I think there's something wrong with that, and I am entitled to my opinion. I, I completely agree. Yeah, I have someone on <laughs> my side. <laughs> uh, I got into it with somebody on my, I, I don't, it's funny because I have an author Facebook page, and um, so every now and then I'll post like a current event article, just say what you think, you know. Right. And I did an article about how, um, Celine Dion was out in Paris and she wasn't wearing any pants. She was wearing like a leotard and a blazer. And so I was just like, what do you think about this? Is Should people wear pants? Will, would she get kicked out of a restaurant? And it's just amazing the amount of people um, who say, you know, why do you talk about this? You shouldn't care about this. And I'm like thinking, well, somebody has to care. Somebody has to talk about it. You know, it needs to be a dialogue. And, and I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just saying, let's talk about dress because yeah. it is. What do we think of this as a society? Yes. Should women wear pants? We need. I think we need pants. Just I think saying. we should probably continue to wear pants. <laughs> um, step in the right direction. <laughs> so I have some questions for you here okay. that I wanted to get to. Um, so why did you decide to start your YouTube channel? Oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> You're like, why did I? <laughs> why did I? Um, I've always enjoyed. I've always been a creator, a cultivator, and. And I, I started as a photographer on the blog and have been doing that for about eight years now. But there's something about the video medium that just brings it to life in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've, we're still sort of finding our footing in the YouTube world because, as you well know, there's many different types of videos. And where we've landed is just is not teaching people how to do things or not even saying this is the way we do things and here's why, but just showing them mm -hmm. and letting them take from that what they will. Um, people like to be told what to do. I just don't want to be the one to tell them. So instead of, you know, let's say, here's how to build a farmhouse bouquet step by step. It's just, here's a bouquet of flowers. Yes. <laughs> and my hope is that it inspires somebody else to go out and grow some flowers. And so that's where we've we've sort of landed with it and I'm happy to be there because I certainly don't have it all together. I don't even know what I'm doing. I shouldn't be instructing anyone on anything. And <laughs> that's how I feel about myself. Funny <laughs> enough. I think we all have that insecurity. I'm like, what am yeah. I doing? What am I even doing here? Um, but I do know what I think is beautiful and that's what I really enjoy sharing mm. with people. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so this is probably such an annoying question to you, but what is it like being a homesteader? Because most of us are not homesteaders. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe wisely so. Um, <laughs> so we, we started homesteading when my daughter was very little and I just got, I had to face this music of like, I have to feed this child and what am I going to feed her? And I just happened upon this vegan book actually at the library and it was the first book that I'd read. I didn't grow up in an environment like this that connected what you ate with certain toxicities in your body or just 
how what you ate affected your health. And once I read that, it sort of planted this seed in my mind. And so we started our homestead. I mean, slowly but surely, we started introducing things like grass-fed meats or raw dairy or homegrown vegetables or fruits. Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, it just became a lifestyle that we really loved. But, you know, day to day, it's a, it's a tough way of living. I mean, there's a reason that, that not everybody does this. It's a lot of work. The yeah. payoff yeah. is huge. Mm. And every day I'm thankful that our kids get to grow up in an environment where they can go out and just pluck a carrot from the ground or, you know, they could literally name the animal <laughs> where yes. this came from or that came from. So the way that we homeschool, you know, we're, we're living in the perfect classroom you for are. that, which is, I'm so thankful that we get to do that. But day in and day out, it's very hard. And I think one of the biggest lessons you have to take away from this lifestyle is that um, you're not in control <laughs> as much as you'd like to be. You know, a storm can come and, and yes, undo yes. all of your work. And so you have to be kind of willing to just roll with the punches. Um, and my, my hope, the lesson that I hope passes down to my children is that as much as I love them, this world is not about you and it doesn't revolve around you. And I'm sorry that you don't want to milk today. And I'm sorry that, you know, we have to go and move these sheep to a new pasture, but that is what has to be done. Mm -hmm. And again, you can teach your children that in all kinds of situations, this is just ours that we've chosen to, to pass those lessons down with. So the lessons and the food definitely outweigh the work, but it is, it's a, it's a hefty calling for sure. Well, I admire it so much. We have a little garden and we don't know what we're doing and <laughs> um, miraculously we grow things, but it's my favorite. I just love walking into the garden. Our strawberries are finally coming in, you know, after years. It's like, I love just picking lettuce and having a salad. It's just the most amazing yeah. thing. It is. It's, it's therapeutic. I mean, it uh, is. One of the gardeners, Monty Don, he's one of Britain's most famed gardeners. Um, I follow him closely. And he started his garden when he lost his jewelry business and he was depressed. And he was somebody suggested to him that he start a garden. And so he did. And that was years ago. And now he's very successful in doing that. But I have found that exact thing where, um, you know, there was even a moment one time when my husband just like took me by the shoulders. He's like, you need to get outside, like go get some dirt therapy, like you're losing it. And there is something about just being outside in the elements, yeah. you know, belonging to something quiet for a moment uh, that's incredibly peaceful and filling. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I love that about uh, that English garden. Yeah. I'll have to look into that a yeah. bit more. I bet Ben would like that story. Yes, um, he probably knows who Monty Don is. He yeah, has to. I'm sure he does. Yeah. He's always talking to me about Alan Titchmarch. Titchmarch. I don't know how to say his name. I don't know who that is. <laughs> He's a very famous <laughs> English know. presenter about gardens. Um, so you pretty much answered my next question, which is what were the biggest lessons you've learned from homesteading? I loved in your book how you uh, talked about um, how homeschooling sometimes looks like doing the math, and then sometimes it's like watching one of the animals give birth, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. that that's so incredible. It's so important for the children to see where food comes from. You know? Oh, absolutely. It's, I've changed a lot in my philosophy on homeschooling. So my husband was originally a teacher in private Christian schools. And so I had all these babies thinking, hey, they're going to go to school. Yes. <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. And their dad's going to be there. And, it, you know, it'll be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when Stu decided to come home to be with me on the farm full time, all of a sudden I was left with these kids that now... I was going to homeschool. So I didn't go into it. Um, I wasn't prepared going into it. So originally I just thought, okay, we're supposed to recreate the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed yeah. to have the calendar on the wall and the desks for everybody to sit in and all the worksheets. You know, I just went to public school. So that's the only context of education that I knew. Yeah. So it was yeah. just like, do this, do this, do this. Well, you've tried to homeschool a, you know, four and a half year old. It doesn't go like that. Yeah. It doesn't go like that at all. So now, you know, three years in, four years in, five years in? No, I don't even know. It's all a blur. <laughs> it's all a blur. Um, I realized that my style of education as, as the teacher is just going to look different than everybody else's because we live in a different yes, classroom, yes. as it were, than other people's. And so that's kind of how I got introduced to Charlotte Mason. And when I read it, it just made sense because very much like you, we were in the habit of cultivating good habits in our children. So it was more important to me that their room was clean and that their 
teeth were brushed and that they learned how to dress themselves, that was, that was homeschool year one, was just learn how to take care of you and your things well, yes. um, treat people well, you know, cultivating character, not just trying to make it through a math worksheet. Right. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Yes to everything. We, this is only our second year homeschooling. Um, and I have actually, by the time this video go- comes out, I will have my homeschooling end of year recap video out. So I'll link that below for people who are interested, but I, same thing. I did not ever expect to homeschool my children. I went to public school too. Mm-hmm. And my husband went to private, you know, well, a boarding school basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so neither of us, it wasn't on our radar at all. It happened to become on our radar. <laughs> And (laughs) it's just what we do now. And I had a huge, I'm still learning. I mean, I will probably be learning for the next, you know, forever, you know, about what I'm doing. So yeah, same thing. We started off the very class, recreating the classroom. And so, but it's so funny. So many people were like, Jennifer, have you, do you know about Charlotte Mason? Everyone's saying Charlotte Mason to me because a lot of the stuff I talk about is in line with her. So over um, time, I really, yeah, I started reading her books and she's just incredible. So it's just mm-hmm. our, it's just so perfect, you know, mm-hmm. and I just see her being your philosophy as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's been amazing, uh, peaceful yeah. to, peaceful. to sort of like, you know what? Every family gets to choose the way that's right for them. Yes. And that's such a freedom yes. that I, I value. We're so this. fortunate to have that freedom. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And this is yeah. what it looks like for us. Like you said, some days it's just watching a, a you give birth and mm-hmm. yeah. great science. <laughs> yeah. Science class. <laughs> well, that is like amazing science class. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk to you about essential oils because you yeah. are so knowledgeable about essential oils and mm-hmm. uh, I'll leave Shay's link down below because she um, is with doTERRA and, and you just know so much. I feel like I have so many oils and I don't know what to do with them other than make cleaning products. So yeah, I need you. No, no, no. <laughs> I know there's so much more. I know. So that's why you're here. So can, tell us what to so, do with our oils. I started just like you where I went, like went to my health food store. I grabbed a few oils. This was when I was you know 17 or something. And all I knew to do was put them in as cleaning products. Yeah. But, um, so I was very resistant to the idea of using essential oils for anything else until I had my third child. And then I started having, uh, I call it postpartum rage because it wasn't depression. It Mm. was, it was rage Mm. just, and I've spoken to many women since who, who know what I'm talking about where you're just outside of yourself. Yeah. Um, and so I went to a doctor and I told him what I was feeling and he was like, it's kind of standard, you know, here's, here's a medication you can take for it. But just so you know, it'll, it'll sort of numb what you're feeling. Mm-hmm. And so you won't feel happy as happy. You won't feel sad as sad. Um, That's scary. It's very scary. He said, you know what? So basically he said, you can feel what you're feeling now, or you can kind of feel nothing. You can kind of be just neutral on all things. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, well, both of those suck. <laughs> I don't want either of those options. Yeah. So that was when a friend suggested essential oils for depression and for anxiety and this rage. And I thought they can't do that. But she gave me a regimen to follow. And I did. I rubbed oils on my spine and on the bottoms of my feet. And I took some internally every day. And lo and behold, it worked. And so after that experience, I thought, you know what, there's going to be something to this. And so I've spent the last six years learning and educating. I, I mean, like you said, you can do cleaning products, and that's a great way to eliminate some toxins in your home. But parents don't often realize that you can use essential oils for ear infections or for pink eye or for digestive issues that your children have. You can use it to help them sleep. You can use it for things like ADD, wow. um, all brain development, speech impairments, all kinds of things. Yeah, or for the definitely. parent who's dealing with, hormone problems after all the pregnancies or milk supply. Um, those are probably women that I help. It usually comes down to stress and anxiety and thyroid issues because that kind of seems to be the, I think I have both of those. I actually just took a blood test. Well, I know I have stress and anxiety. (laughs) That's not in question, but I, I just took a blood test to see if I have thyroid issues as well. But, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I am so exhausted, like, dead tired. And I know that that's because I have four children. One of them's a baby and everything I'm doing, but I feel like it's a bit more than that. Like there's something wrong. So 
Well, there's also things you can do just to naturally uplift your energy and just sort of stimulate your systems to go using oils. And I mean, what I love about them is they can literally help everybody. They can help your baby if he has colic. They can help you for sleeping. They can help your dad if he has high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. They're really kind of an untapped tool. But it's been neat to see in the medical industry just in the six years that I've been doing this how things have shifted mm -hmm. because now hospitals are using them for things like MRSA or, you know, staph infections really? that are antibiotic resistant or they're prescribing them for things like stress and anxiety because of, you know, how addicted people get to sort of medications. And it's been, it's been amazing to see. I really kind of think that's the way the pendulum's going now that we're all aware of how over prescribed we are for things. Yes. We want a more holistic approach to healing. Absolutely. And I, I, I think the last hospital survey that I read was that they surveyed doctors and nurses of was 80% of the things that they saw patients for could be taken care of at home with just proactive self care. Wow. Which is incredible. That's when incredible. you think about the medical yeah. crisis that we're facing in our country, we have the solution, you know, yeah. we need to learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. So I have two essential oil questions for you. I have uh, I have a lot of doTERRA oils. My friend Antoinette used to um, sell them, and so I got them from her. And so I have oregano. Yes. What, what do I do with oregano? Yeah. Oregano is not one you're going to use very often. Right. That's what she said. I look at it like nature's antibiotic. So if you're dealing with like strep throat or a sinus infection or something of that nature, what I do, it's you don't want to taste it. It's horrible. Mm. Um, you can put it in a little veggie capsule okay. and I would take like two or three drops of oregano in internally every two to three hours until your symptoms. Wow. Okay. I'm going to try very that. Cool. Yeah. Then the other one is frankincense and I, that's like my favorite. It smells good. I like putting it on my skin. What, what do you recommend with the frankincense? That's actually a really, really good one for anxiety and depression. That was one in my protocol. So when I'm feeling a little like I need to be brought down to earth a little bit, a little high strung. Um, uneasy in my in my skin, you know that feeling. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sadly, put a few drops of it under your tongue. It's the most powerful way you can take an oil because it doesn't. Your liver doesn't have to metabolize it. It goes directly into your bloodstream. So frankincense is a resin, which means it's a really grounding oil. Mm -hmm. So immediately you're going to feel that pull down to earth. This is also one. So FDA, if you're watching this, please turn away. <laughs> This is an anti-cancer oil. And so this is one that I rub at the base of my brain and along my spine every day mm -hmm. because we store so many viruses in our spine constantly. It's where mm -hmm. our body puts things until we get stressed and then they come out. So this is one that I am constantly putting there. Or if you're just feeling like, like every day I rub it at the bottoms of my feet before bed because it was part of my rage protocol and, and it worked. And so I just... And keep it up. Keep do it up. Do you mix it with the carrier oil when you do that, or do you just directly do it? I do it directly. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have sensitive skin, but frankincense is a very mild oil. Okay. Yeah. It's powerful, but it's not like oregano that's very, what we call a hot oil. I always mm -hmm. think of the three wise men bringing gold, frankincense, and water, yes. you know? It's yes. like, hello, it has to be good, right? It has incredible value. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll leave Shay's uh, link down below, so if you want to... And I'm sure you answer questions if people, well, I don't want to offer that up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fuller if you have questions, you can ask her. Yeah. yeah okay, good. Here I am offering your, <laughs> as if you don't have enough to reply no, to. That's, that's actually what I spend. I mean, my work days now are mostly full of helping people who message me, you know, particular health concerns that they need help with. Oh, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, okay. I wanted to talk to you about, oh, I noticed in your videos that you wear a half apron and it looks so chic. <laughs> and I want to try this. However, I always splatter something on me. So what? tell me yeah. about the half apron. Well, you might have nicer clothes than I do that you need to protect. I don't think I do. <laughs> you wear white a lot. I notice you wear white shirts. I, I do. I wear black a lot too. Um, yeah. Solid colors I, I wear often. But no, I. here's the thing about women. Going back to fashion, let's go back on this soapbox for a moment. Women have waists. And this is a yes. beautiful feature no matter what size you are, you are, it is, it always looks good for a woman to define her waist. I agree. Mm -hmm. And it kills me when I see women who will wear the shirt that goes down kind of like half on their butt cheek almost, or just a little bit above. And you thought, you think, no, you're, 
it's totally wrong. Like, look at the, look at the shape of your body. Yeah. Uh, so what I really love about the half aprons is that they sit right there. So I, can I know be, it looks so good. It looks so it, chic. It's a nice look. It's yeah. just a nice look. So, um, yeah, that's actually all I wear. I have a few, I have a few full ones that I wear when we're doing something particularly dirty, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, mostly just the half apron. I, I have love to try that. I always wear the full apron and then I double it up in front. So I create the waist there, but I always yeah, cover, you, you know, yeah. but it's, yeah. it's, I always get really embarrassed when people come over and I'm wearing an apron because nobody wears aprons anymore. And yeah. they think, what are you, a, you know, a 1950s housewife, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. No, mine, I put it on in the morning. I call it my cape. And it doesn't come off. It doesn't come off until I go to bed or, you know, we're sitting down to a nice dinner. But you're right. I guess you don't feel so uh, matronly in a way. Yes, when you it's less matronly. matronly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try it. Well, we'll see yeah. if I stay yeah. in my clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so really quickly, I know we're going over. Let's see how we're already at 30 minutes. Okay, but I have to ask this question. Can you tell us about your beauty routine? Because you wear oh. very minimal makeup, but you look chic. Yeah. You always yes. have lipstick on, is that right? Always. Yeah. Always have lipstick on. I have like the palest natural lips. I just, it drives me mad. Um, so wash my face at night. I use a really good essential oil called Yarrow Palm every night. Um, get up, just wash with water. And yeah, I do a very no makeup look like you often talk mm-hmm. about. So a little bit of foundation, just, you know, half a pea size just to kind of help. <laughs> and then... Of course, under eye concealer because yes. I'm a mom. I think the thing that makes it look, makes me look more tended is that I always do my eyebrows mm-hmm. because I am Norwegian. And so I, like, I have naturally blonde hair, actually. This is dyed. Um, really light eyebrows, really light eyelashes. And so I always pencil in my eyebrows, which kind of just gives a little defined. Yeah. You do that and you put on lipstick and you're totally fine. Yes. And actually, this 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 is a big point of contention with my readers because some love it and some hate it. I get eyelash ex- extensions every month. I think they look great. Thank you. I do it because I don't want to do my eye makeup every morning. It actually saves me a ton of time. And so I love being able to just, I mean, if I'm really in a pinch, it's just concealer and eyebrows and lip gloss. Yeah. And I have it in 30 seconds, I can be done. So I'm not willing to be the type of mom who just doesn't wear any makeup because I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I've just gotten it down. Even like a full face of makeup will take maybe two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm at about five minutes. I can do it in five minutes. So so what do people have a problem with the eyelash extensions? I'm always amazed at what what people come up with. Yeah, it's it's just funny, isn't it? Um, I think when people think of a homesteader or a stay-at-home mom or a gardener or a homeschooler or a homeschooler, they just, they want to pin you or, or even like a, you know, a natural crunchy sort of a person like we are, they want to put you in a box and say, well, people like that don't wear red lipstick. People like that don't wear eyelash extensions because that's something like maybe a city person does, (laughs) you know, (laughs) which is just silly. And you just think. You know, I grew up in the type of culture where people were very boxed in. It's like if you ate this type of food, then you listened to this type of music and you drove this type of car and like you didn't venture out of that. And I, when I met my husband, he was from the South and, you know, he grew up hunting, but then he went backpacking through Europe. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, how can you be in both? How can you be cultured and refined and also country at the same time? Yeah, it didn't make any sense to me. Right. And And so he kind of opened my eyes to this idea that, no, you can... You can just be. And I, yeah, it was you can just be who you want to be. Exactly. Be. And that's so it's free. Like, wow. So you know, if I, I, eyelashes, I can do that and I can still grow organic, you know, carrots and that's fine. Yes. So, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> I love that. I have so many women that say to me, you know, Jennifer, I just wear yoga pants every day because I'm embarrassed to put on a dress because then everyone's going to ask me where I'm going because I've been dressing like this for so long. Yeah. And so oh, many yeah. people have said, I found freedom because I don't. I, you know, it's okay to wear a dress mm-hmm. when you have nowhere to go. Like when what happened happen- in our culture where we suddenly can't do that anymore? And you know what? When you're home, just, you know, schmucking around all day, it, that's actually a really perfect time to wear a dress. Yes. Because all of a sudden, making breakfast and doing the dishes and folding laundry feels better. Yes. And it feels a lot 
there. <laughs> yeah, and the atmosphere sets the affection. And once you become used to that, once you are used to wearing dresses on a regular basis, it will become your new, that will become your affection. And mm-hmm. then you'll want to do it all the time. And then you won't feel, it's like, I, I you'll never ever see me uh, out in like yoga pants and a crop top. And I'm not, you know, I'm not criticizing the women who do that. But I'm just mm-hmm. saying you won't see me doing it because I don't, I won't feel comfortable in that because I've right. set my affection toward um, dressing up in a different way, you know? So mm-hmm. I always say to women, if that's your desire, you can do it. You know, if you want to break out of that routine of, of wearing, you know, the same thing every day, you can't. Right. I, I remember when that happened for me, when I decided I had just gotten done having my fourth baby and I almost had never learned to be a woman because I went from adolescence to, you know, marriage to four babies and nursing and I got done and I thought oh so now how do I know how to be like how do I dress like a woman I know how to dress when I'm pregnant yes (laughs) but I just hadn't grown up to that capacity yet and I went to my little sister's baby shower I my friend helped me and she's like okay here's how we're gonna dress now like here's what we're gonna do she helped me pick out clothes and I went to her baby shower and I had this really beautiful kind of red wine colored long skirt on that hit below the knees I wore black high heels, a little black t-shirt and lipstick. And it was amazing. People were just like, you look, you look fabulous. Like, why are you dressed like this? And it, and it kind of, in a way it's, if you find an affection for that, we're kind of just countering the pendulum because there's always going to be the person who shows up in, you know, sweatpants or whatever. But in order to keep culture from just totally falling in the swamp, there has to be a weight on the other side. Yes. It's in one of your books, I believe you say, um, you know, try to be the the best dressed person in the room. Like when you're going to an event and you think, oh, I'll just, we're just going to go have ice cream. I'll just wear a sweatshirt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like what if you just tried to be the best dressed person in the restaurant Mm -hmm. and took it as this kind of challenge? And that's always been encouraging to me to just take the next step, you know, like, Add a necklace, wear your nicer shoes, yeah. um, put a little jacket on and yeah, it's, it's been great. It makes every day that much more fun. It does. It makes every day special. Mm-hmm. It does. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the channel. This was, I could talk to you for hours. I, know, I was just going to say, I think we could go for much I know longer. you have to come back, <laughs> but definitely check out Shay's books. Um, and you have a few more books coming out. Is that right? I, I have, I have three other cookbooks. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave all of her information down below. Go subscribe to her channel. Check it out. Say hi to Shay over there. And thank you so much for visiting us today. You're welcome. I hope that you come back. Yes, will do. All right. Thanks so much for joining us today on The Daily Connoisseur, and we will see you next time. Bye.